to Argentina! <laughs> okay, so who here speaks English? Who here doesn't speak English? Hey, there's one, two, three. Cool, so, okay. <laughs> Let's get into it. So, how many of you played Half-Life 2? Nice. Do you remember in Half-Life 2 there was that part where basically they had a lot of screens in the game and a lot of characters would talk to you through those screens? Funny thing, those screens weren't playing a pre-recorded video. Those characters were actually right outside the level in real time, and if you use a noclip function, you can find them, and they look hilarious. <laughs> or, in Skyrim, you have these mannequins uh, in a DLC or something that you can equip your armor on to like show it off. It turns out they're not just mannequins, they're retextured NPCs with their AI turned off, and every now and then, their AI turns on, and they start following you, which is super <laughs> terrifying. Or, in Metal Gear uh, Solid, which was made in 1998, I think, uh, there was this super cool whiteboard in the game that had these super cool reflections on them, and you couldn't really do like real-time reflection back then, so it's just a room behind the whiteboard with some reflection-like textures on it, which is mind-blowing. But in case you haven't figured it out already, um, this talk is about developers using unorthodox fixes to their problems in the game. Uh, it's basically a collection of interesting problem solving and the kind of fixes you would make in your game, but you would say, there's no way Blizzard is doing that. But it turns out they are. Um, so really quickly, I want to thank uh, Simon and She Says for helping me find some of these um, bugs and also providing footage for them. Uh, but really quickly, who am I? Um, I am Nikolai Berbeche, and I usually start my talks uh, with how people cannot pronounce my name, especially in the US, because they don't roll their R's, so I kind of become Nikolai Beerbees. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to play a quick video of two of my favorite YouTubers. Speaking of Patreon, we also want to thank our Patreon. Thank you, Nikolai Berbice, Berbice, Nikolai Thank you. <laughs> so I kind of quickly became Nikolai Barbecue. It's, it's much easier to pronounce. Anyway, I'm from Romania, which is kind of far. Uh, vampires and stuff. Um, and I founded a company called Those Awesome Guys. We're a super small team. We're from all over the world, and we make weird games like Move or Die. Uh, really quickly, this is how Move or Die looks like. What happens when you combine every party game ever created together? That would be pretty stupid. But we think Okay, enough of that, you can Google that. Anyway, those awesome guys, uh, Move or Die, it's a, it's a four player uh, friendship ruining game. I like to call it that, apparently it's very good at doing that. Uh, and I've been a self-proclaimed game designer for 10 years now, since like my first game, it's been 10 years. Um, point is, I still have no idea what I'm doing. And that's kind of the idea of this talk, is that it's perfectly okay to not know what you're doing. Um, and I grew up, playing weird games like Warcraft 2 and Heroes 3 and Earthworm Jim and some other uh, weird titles. And I also grew up uh, when things like these were playing on the TV. They started out a generation ago as simple black and white paintball games on a TV screen. That's the How It's Made episode on video games. And the funny thing is, within like 12 minutes, they go from the idea to the finished product. Uh, but anyway, even though it was funny back then, um, uh, it was still super interesting because I wasn't a game developer back then, and that kind of episode got me curious in how games work, and they got me kind of motivated to try to make my own stuff. So I started messing around with games, looking through the, their files and folders, and I started, for example, making my own sprays in Counter-Strike, or starting messing around with the Warcraft 3 uh, level editor in the pursuit of trying to create something. Um, but that's boring, so let's go back to some more weird examples. Um, let's see, Force 21. 
Um, Force 21 was um, an RTS game made way back in the day, can't even remember the year, uh, where you would control some units and obviously you would have a camera that would follow those units and it turns out every now and then the camera would stop following those units and players had no idea what was happening. It usually happened when an explosion would occur and the developers said that one of the testers noticed that it happened more often when an airstrike occurred near your vehicles. The camera was right from the physical objects class, so it was using velocity, acceleration, and it could be collided with. This also meant that it could take damage. So the airstrike did enough damage in a large enough radius that they were quite literally killing the camera. However, I did fix the bug by ensuring that cameras couldn't take damage, but just to be sure, I boosted their armor and hit points to ridiculous <laughs> levels. So they literally had the toughest camera in any game. <laughs> I mean, it's a legit fix. Uh, Wing Commander, a super popular one. Um, in Wing Commander, during development, whenever they would close the game, like whenever they would quit the game, uh, it would give out an error, and it would say EMM386 memory manager error. Now, because they had to meet quite strict deadlines, uh, what one of the developers did was, instead of actually fixing the source of the problem, he hex edited the error message to say, thank you for playing Wing Commander. <laughs> which is the same thing the new Tetris game did on the Nintendo 64 nine years later. So apparently it's a, it's a legit fix. Um, Sacred 2, really cool RPG game, top down. You have all these caves that you can explore with all these interesting entrances with light rays coming out of them. And it turns out those light rays are coming from a huge mirror that's scaled up right behind the entrance because the developers just so happen to have that effect coded on that mirror. So yay, asset reusing. Um, Fallout New Vegas, really quickly, spoiler warning. Um, when you finish Fallout New Vegas, you talk to an NPC, you get some lines of dialogue, then a quick loading screen, and then some slideshows of like consequences of your actions. Now, it turns out uh, the narrator that's narrating things in the background is coming from an NPC right behind you called Ron the Narrator. <laughs> and your character is stuck in place, and the slideshow is literally a red textured wall. Thank you, Bethesda. I hope no one from Bethesda is here in the audience today. Um, World of Warcraft. Did you know that in World of Warcraft, they're using invisible bunnies to cast spells and like trigger events? And one of the developers said that spells need casters, so we often have to rely on spawning in an invisible creature to be the one to actually cast the spell. Different games use different invisible creatures, but for WoW, it's mostly bunnies. And they even reference that in the game with the item Kajakola, where if you drink it, you get like plus two intellect, and you start yelling out random ideas in the chat. And one of those ideas is, invisible bunnies will put them all over the place, and they'll control everything. And the developer was right, because not only World of Warcraft is doing that, also Anarchy Online does the exact same thing, uh, as well as Guild Wars, and my personal favorite, Titan Quest, where we use the length of animations from invisible squirrels placed in the level as timers for scripted events. Sadly, I couldn't find any photos of invisible squirrels. Um, and I think League of Legends does the same thing with minions, or it did back in the day. Um, Batman, Arkham City. This is personally one of my favorite tricks in a game. Um, in Batman, you have these railings throughout the game, and you're kind of, they're kind of visible everywhere. And they have a fairly complex shape, and you notice they have some depth to them. Any artist in this room would know that modeling out that shape would be pretty stupid because there would be a lot of polygons. So what they did instead was they used one texture with opacity, duplicated it, and offset it a little bit to create this parallax effect. And that blew my mind. That's so smart. And yes, it does kind of break at super extreme angles. <laughs> But realistically, no player will pay attention to that. So really, really good stuff. Um, speaking of League of Legends, um, back in the day in their, I think, the first championship, you know how League of Legends is usually like 5v5? Well, during tournaments, they didn't have a proper uh, spectating system. So instead, they made it 6v6, where the sixth champion would just be the spectator uh, and most of the time it would be Timo because he has a passive ability that makes him invisible. So he would just lay there. Yay, Riot. Um, 
Deus Ex. Now, in Deus Ex, if you Google it, uh, you'll stumble upon this screenshot, which is quite a popular screenshot for the game. And every time I saw it, I was like, there's something off about those reflections. Uh, they look way too sharp and perfect. And yes, it's exactly what you think it is. It's the whole damn level geometry flipped and put under the floor. And the floor is just slightly transparent, and that works. The impressive part is that they also did it for NPCs that are animated, so cool stuff. Um, let's see, Fallout 3, uh, also a very popular one. Um, in Fallout 3, you have this train, and this train is supposed to take you places. Um, and normally, a programmer would make this train into like a standalone entity, but in this case, it's an item worn on an NPC's arm of all places. Um, and if you check this in the editor to see how the animation looks, Bethesda. <laughs> anyway, going back to my story, I was, I was saying how I was starting to mod games to, to, to get into game development, and I even made my own uh, voice packs for the Worms games, which was hilarious, at least for me back then. Um, and I grew up on a website called Newgrounds. Who here knows what Newgrounds is? Nice. For everyone else, Newgrounds was a Flash portal. You could find a lot of Flash animations and Flash games and um, artwork and writers and programmers. It was a very cool, like, creative place to be in. Um, and I started making games, Flash games, on Newgrounds. But because I'm not a programmer, I would use this weird program that would allow me to make games with no coding. And they weren't really games, you know? They, they were overly glorified, like, sound boards. You would click some buttons and they would make some sounds. Um, and I was using this program called 3D Flash Animator, and I think in my whole life I've met like only three guys that were aware of this program. Uh, it's a really bad program, anyway. Um, but later on I started hanging out on the forums of Newgrounds and I started teaming up with programmers to make actual real games, you know, the kind with a game over screen. Um, but it still felt I wasn't doing things properly. Um, and I had this thing called the imposter syndrome, which I've only fairly recently uh, realized what it is. Uh, it's that feeling that everyone else is better at what you're doing than you are. And it's a horrible feeling, and I'm pretty sure most of us experience this because we all feel like we're not belonging and we're not good at what we're doing. And this is especially bad when you work on your own uh, in your living room with people remotely, but there's no one to bounce ideas off of uh, right in the same room. So you start questioning yourself. And every now and then, after you work like two years on a game, you go like, is it worth doing what I'm doing? Like, should I actually finish this game? And that's a horrible period to go through, um, especially when your desk looks like this. Um, so I was using 3D Flash Animator when everyone else was using Adobe Flash, Macromedia Flash back then. Um, so this feeling of not doing things properly was echoed even in the programs that I was using. Uh, I was using a mouse to make the art in my games when everyone else was using a tablet. And whenever I would see like a behind the scenes uh, video on how games are made, all the artists were using tablets and they would have this seal of approval of Bleh. Anyway, I was super comfortable with my mouse, but I felt like I was doing something wrong. I was using Sony Vegas to make the trailers for my games when everyone else was using uh, Adobe Premiere. And yeah, that feeling was lingering there and it was horrible and very boring, so let's get back to some more examples. Um, back to Skyrim. I should make like a Bethesda section in this talk. Um, we all know that uh, thing where you can put like a basket on a vendor's head and they can't see anymore and you start stealing stuff. <laughs> However, did you know that most vendors in Skyrim keep their goods in a chest under the level and with some clever jumps you can steal their shit properly? Uh, also, in Skyrim, I've seen this uh, screenshot of that bookshelf next to that desk. Exactly the same asset. It's just one of them is slightly moved into the ground. So <laughs> if you've ever felt bad by doing something like this, don't. Or apply at Bethesda. Um, more Fallout. <laughs> Go figure. But this one, it's, a, it's about a mod. So there's this mod in Fallout 4 called Old World Radio. And what it does is it adds new radio station in the game, so it adds more variety. However, um, users of the mod would complain that they would hear a cat behind them every now and then, and they would turn around and there would be no cat. So the developer of the mod said that, 
I spawn an invisible silenced cat 500 units behind the player when a non-active radio station switches tracks in the background. In normal circumstances, the cat doesn't make sound. It's silenced, invisible, and deleted from the game after three seconds. <laughs> we all know how that goes. <laughs> Gang beasts. Another one of my favorite tricks. Um, it's made by my friends at Boneloff, and it's a party game where they had this one level where a train would pass through the level twice. There were two train tracks, and it would go one way and then the other way. Now, it turns out they couldn't figure out how to make that work properly, so what they did instead was they made a room in which the train goes and the whole damn room turns around. To... <laughs> anyway, you're laughing, but it works, right? So, <laughs> what the developer said uh, was that we needed to get trains to change tracks quickly. So, instancing them created a noticeable lag, and teleporting them was unsuccessful at the time. We had to finish quickly for an event, and so the dirty hack came in. But to their credit, I'm happy to say it's done correctly now. We pull several trains and teleport them. Not that anyone would notice. But yeah, um, Fallout 2, not made by Bethesda. Um, so in Fallout 2, the super old one, uh, you had this car and you would use this car to navigate the map. And it turns out every now and then, players would complain that their car was split in two. And that was a bit weird because those separate parts were in different parts of the map. And it turns out that's because the trunk is actually a follower NPC programmed to be the e-mobile while the front part is an exit to the map with a unique driving animation. Sometimes the game forgets to spawn them both at the same time and accidentally gives the trunk follower AI. So it, the trunk tries to follow the player. <laughs> it's literally nightmare fuel. Um, Civilization 1, another super popular one. Um, in Civilization 1, you had like Gandhi. Uh, and Gandhi was programmed to represent his real life counterpart. So he was super peaceful. And all the leaders in the game had like an aggressiveness level. Gandhi had an aggressiveness level of 1. However, if you adopt dem democracy in the game, you would drop the aggressiveness of all the leaders by two. This puts Gandhi at minus one. The programmers didn't see that coming, and Gandhi started dropping way more nukes than any other leader in the game. <laughs> and he also kind of became a meme in the process. And they even referenced this in the later games with, with an Easter egg. Um, but yeah, let's do, let's do a rapid fire round. Um, Fallout 3, do you know how when you start the game you start out as a baby? Turns out they didn't have a proper baby model, so they just shrunk down the player. Uh, Jack and Daxter, uh, it's an open world game, uh, I think on the PS1 or PS2, and you could explore the, the, the map, uh, but it was very hard to load data quickly back then. So if you happen to go too fast and the game would need some time to load a certain area in front of you, your characters would just fall, they would trip, and then they would slowly get up. And you as the player would go like, well that was weird, but that was the developer's method of buying themselves some time to load the next area, which is super clever. Um, high octane, uh, high octane old racing games with all these vehicles, futuristic vehicles with all these weird stats that you can use. Turns out none of those stats do anything. And the developer said that in high octane, we simply display different stats for vehicles without ever actually changing them under the hood. They can get away with this shit. Can you imagine it like, <laughs> Jesus. Um, Paperboy. In Paperboy, uh, you had these uh, checkpoint races and the designer needed a way to control the timing of those checkpoints. And he needed a physical object in the level to control those checkpoints. And it turns out that object is this penguin that shows up in every single level, even though it makes no sense for him to be there. But designers, what you gonna do? Um, Portal 2. Now, if you remember in Portal 2, there's this part where Wheatley is behind some frosted glass and he gets scared by a bird. Who here remembers that part? You played Portal, right? Cool. Now, this is how the bird looks. <laughs> it's literally like two black polygons. Which makes no sense because if you played Portal 2, you know they have a super detailed bird model later in the game. So, I don't know what, anyway. Uh, oh, this is another favorite of mine. In Lord of the Rings Online, um, the first uh, mounts, like horses and whatnot, they added in the game, they were literally programmed as pants. 
that you equip on your character and they happen to have this model and this animation. Uh, and I know you don't believe me, so Google it, it's true. <laughs> um, Donkey Kong 64. Now in Donkey Kong 64, they have a game-breaking bug that would uh, crush the game every time, except when you play it with the eight megabyte expansion pack. Um, and yeah, they still don't know the cause of that bug, so their fix was to just ship the expansion pack with every single copy of the game and market it as extra RAM, like better graphics, you know, like marketing mambo jumbo. Um, but yeah, something, something, memory leaks. Um, what else? The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. You know when you start the game, you see Link sleeping in his bed, and then the camera transitions to a different part where you see like Navi talking to the Deku tree and all that. Turns out Link isn't actually sleeping. He's like, right there. So <laughs> if you move the camera a little bit, it turns out the character had to be in every single cutscene because back then they were tying rendering and controller pulling to the character. So yeah, something to keep in mind. Anyway, back to my story. So I was using all these weird programs and they made me feel all weird inside because hey, I wasn't doing things properly. Um, and I was making flash games. Now, for those of you who know, flash games don't really feel like real games. They don't really take that much space on the screen. They're like super tiny in the browser. And I always wanted to make a game that can run in full screen because in my stupid head, that's what a good game, like a real game is like. You know, the kind of game that ends in a .exe and has its own icon, that's a real game. So. In my stupid pursuit of trying to make my games feel real, I was doing a lot of stupid things, like adding fake loading screens in my Flash games. <laughs> now, Flash games are small things. They don't need that much time to load, but if you saw a slow progress bar, you were like, oh, this must be good. <laughs> <laughs> so, please don't do this. <laughs> and those stupid tricks kind of continued. For example, in Concern Joe, um, uh, flash game of mine that was reimagined, uh, that later became Move or Die, um, we made our own level editor, and it was like a slow narration-based puzzle platformer. So at one point, I wanted to make a level that has like two branching paths, and the engine had some limitations, and I literally couldn't do that. You could only have one entrance and one exit for each level. So I said, fuck it, I'm gonna do it anyway. So I made a level with two branching paths, and if you take the top path, it looks like this, the narrator makes a joke about it, and then you just reach the actual exit of the level, and you're done. However, if you take the bottom path, it was designed to feel like you were not supposed to go there, and the narrator says this. Oh, wow, you actually thought that was real. I gotta take a screenshot of this. You are so adorable when you're confused. I am not looking this to the internet immediately. What's the internet? Don't, don't worry. Now, for those of you who noticed, I used that screenshot excuse to flash the whole screen white and teleport the player on the top path, which was an exact recreation of the bottom path. Please don't do this. Uh, later on, when the game became Move or Die, um, we started showcasing the game. And I would go to a lot of events. We would showcase the game. It was a party game, so we would get uh, big crowds. However, if you showcase your game, like who here showcased their game at this event? Nice. Have you noticed those bugs that only show up during events and then when you try to fix them at home, they don't show up at all? We got the same thing and our game was crashing a lot because it wasn't very stable. So instead of actually fixing those problems, I was like, ah, but I'm smart. I'm gonna make a program that checks when the game runs and if the game doesn't run, it would run the game. So every time the game would crash, it would just restart on its own and there, is one way you can make this flawless and seamless, and that is to set your wallpaper to a loading screen. No one notices it. Please don't do this. <laughs> but it worked for me, right? So anyway, um, if you actually played Move or Die, you, you notice that we have a lot of characters and they have these outlines to them, the colored outlines, and there are a million and one ways to make an outline in a game. Uh, however, we picked the worst one, which is duplicate the character eight times, color it, and slightly offset it. And I know all the programmers in the room are yelling right now inside, but it's really good with alpha, right? And 
And it also, if the character has super sharp features, they translate in the outline very well, opposed to a more traditional like shader way. Then I know you can use shaders to make this. However, I was playing Heroes of the Storm, and Blizzard is doing the exact same shit. So if it's good enough for Blizzard, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Hello, Argentina. <laughs> So yeah, I, I, I watched um, Indie Game the Movie, and we've all seen Indie Game the Movie, and it's following these super three entitled developers that made their own games and they were successful. And I was like, I always want to be in that kind of movie because they had their own silly American entitled problems like, oh, my game doesn't show up correctly on the front page of Xbox, right? And I was there at home with way sillier problems like, I really hope people pirate my game. <laughs> Because in my mind, that's what makes a successful game. Like, if you go out of your way to pirate it, it means it's really good. So I was also working on Move or Die when the first Indie Humble Bundle came out. And it had games from those developers in that movie. So they were like super, um, um, they had the stamp of approval. And I was like, I always wanted to be in a, in a Humble Bundle one day. So I worked on Move or Die. I worked on it for four years. And I can finally say I made it. I made a game that's .exe, <laughs> and it even has its own icon. <laughs> but I made a game that runs in full screen, and we even ended up on the front page of Steam. Um, and we also ended up in random cinemas around the world where people played the game without me paying them, which is weird. <laughs> and also players on Steam use our avatars Again, without me paying them, it's insane. Um, and we also ended up on the front page of Twitch, above Minecraft and like Call of Duty. It was like for a solid two minutes, but I got this screenshot. <laughs> and we, we were even tweeted by, by Twitch and by Adult Swim when we got approval to use Rick and Morty in the game, uh, legally. And uh, I made a game that was modded hundreds of times. We have hundreds and thousands of characters and, uh, and levels made by our players. Uh, and we ended up in a humble bundle that was dedicated for multiplayer games. That was really, really cool. Um, also, one cool thing that I like to do is whenever I'm about to release a game, I Google the name of the game, and I just go through like pages of random search results that make no sense. And then after I release my game, I do that same thing, and I experience the power of changing Google results. <laughs> it's like a really empowering feeling. You should do this. Um, oh, and yet the game was pirated by a lot of players. Like 44.7% of players are pirates, and I'm perfectly okay with that because I don't give a shit about piracy. I made the game so people can play it. So if you can't afford it or you're just not in the mood to buy it, pirate it. I don't care. Play my game. Uh, <laughs> However, while working on the game, I would do my best to like yell about it and put out trailers and videos and photos of it out there. And whenever I would do that, the fan base of my game was my friends, my real friends, because they knew what I was doing and I knew them personally. So therefore, all the comments on those videos were like, hey, you should do this, you should do that, because they were writing them directly addressed to me. They knew me in the real life. However, after doing this for a while, that fan base grew, and it started including people that were not in my group of friends. And those comments quickly transitioned to they. They should do this, and they should do that. And it's a very weird feeling. I've, I've passed that threshold, and I became that vague developer entity. Um, and it's kind of a nice feeling. However, just to give you an idea, I still, I, I still have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I started working on the game sometime in 2012. And then the game came out in 2016. Now, after the game came out on PC, I was like, I would love to put my game on consoles. So I contacted Sony. They were like, cool, just go on our website and uh, give us a game design document. So I made my game design document after my <laughs> game came out. Because it was just me and a friend of mine. It was all in my head. I didn't need a design document. But anyway. With, with this whole story and all those examples in mind and my own experience, the conclusion I reached is that successful developers are using the same brand of duct tape you are. So don't worry, because there will come one day when you will become they. Thank you.